This video is about state classification, which we need to talk about the steady state behavior of a Markov chain. So recall that we've been talking about homogeneous, finite state, discrete time Markov chains. So what that means is that we had a Markov chain where time is discrete. Um, the transition probabilities from time to time are the same, that's homogeneous, and there's a finite number of states. And we name those states one through k for convenience. So um, we fully specified a Markov chain with an initial distribution. So that's the probability of where we are at time zero and transition probabilities, which we wrote as P, J, K for J and K from one to K, big K. And we drew this um, in the diagram below. We're going to draw these transition probabilities using arcs. Okay, so this is the probability of going to state K from state J and we usually draw these, writing the values if we know them, using these arcs. And here I'm drawing this diagram as if every state is connected to every other state, including a self loop. And if I actually had a zero probability, okay, so here I have all positive probabilities. If I had a zero probability, I would not draw an arc between J and K. So that's just a reminder of how we draw these Markov chains. So the state probability vector at time t just encodes the probability of occupying every state at that time. So states 1 through k, I write the probability of occupancy as a vector, and that evolves according to this matrix. Okay, so this big matrix P, which captures all of the transition probabilities, and we call it the transition probability matrix. Okay, so this is just a matrix where the row encodes the current state, and the column encodes the next state. And I just write all the transition probabilities as a matrix, and I can update my probabilities by multiplying by that matrix transposed. What I want to know is what happens to the state vector PT in the long run. So does it settle into a limit? So does it converge? And it could also oscillate forever. And to answer this question, I need to look more carefully at the structure of my Markov chain. And what I mean by structure will become apparent as we go along, but basically it just means this picture I have below, but I only care about where the probabilities are zero and non-zero, so where the arcs actually exist. Okay, so let's work through a quick example here. So let's come back to this original example we had in the previous videos. It's going to be a two-state Markov chain, so I have it here. And remember the transition uh, matrix just looks like this. So previously, we played around with this uh, example, and we showed that if we start in state 1, then the probabilities at state at time two, 1 and 2 look like this. So by multiplying by that matrix P, we got that P1 is 1 fifth, 4 fifths, and P2 is 13 20 fifths, 12 20 fifths. So we could keep doing this using this update equation, right? So I can just keep tracking what happens to the occupancy probabilities or the state uh, vector. And I'm going to just plot that here. Okay, so I worked this out in MATLAB, and I'm going to plot for you what's happening for these um, probabilities. So these are the ones that we worked out, and we can see it'll just keep bouncing around, but it is converging to some asymptotic uh, value. Okay, so you can see here that they're really settling in, and if you work out the limit, it would be four sevenths and three sevenths. And what that means in the long run, I'm spending three sevenths of my time in state one, and the rest of the time, four sevenths, is spent in state two. And it doesn't matter how my initial state is chosen. So here, I chose it to be one zero, but it turns out if we had restarted the simulation for any choice of P zero, we would still converge to the same asymptotic values. So do all Markov chains exhibit the same behavior as this simple two-state Markov chain, or is that something special? And if they do have this kind of limiting behavior, how do we actually figure out the limit, um, which here was four sevenths and three sevenths? Okay, so I didn't tell you how I got these values. I just kind of, I guess, inferred it from this plot, but we can solve for them very easily. Okay, so formally, what I want to know is um, I want to actually determine what we're going to call the limiting 
probability state vector. Okay, so we've thought about the probability state vector at time t, and now we're just wondering about its limit as t goes to infinity. We'll call it pi. Okay, so this pi is just what a vector of all the individual uh, probabilities take into their limit. And we know by normalization, it's got to sum up to one. But first, before we talk about limits, we always have to check that the limit actually exists. And this is going to be an issue for us here. So here's one problem where it might not exist. So if there are some kinds of periodic oscillations in the chain, it may never converge to a limit. Okay, so here's a very simple example, two-state Markov chain, probability of one of switching, and I never stay on my own value. So if I start on one, then I'm going to go to two, then back to one, and then back to two. And so I'm going to be at one on the even times and two at the odd times, okay? And so the resulting sequence that I'm going to see here is going to be one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, and this does not have a limit, okay? It's just gonna bounce around forever. And you might think that was my choice of initial distribution, but it wasn't. Really, any distribution I pick, except uh, one half, one half, will not have a limit. So basically, I will not get pulled in to some limit. Basically, anything I choose will bounce around. Okay, the other kind of problem I could see is that there might be some states that are unreachable from other states. Okay, so let's look at an example. So here I'm gonna draw a three state Markov chain and two can go to uh, one or three, but it can't come back. And so I'm gonna start on two. Okay, and then what's gonna happen is with probability one half, I could then jump from state two to state one, and then I'll stay in state one forever. Okay, so for all other times, I'm just gonna be sitting in state one and then other, the other half of the time, I'll jump to state three. And then for the rest of time, I'm just going to sit in state three. So in this case, you know, it does settle into some values, but there's no unique limiting probability state vector. It really depends on this particular random jump in the beginning. Okay, so it's very sensitive to that first jump. And we wanna just avoid all of these problematic cases as we get started. So we're gonna look only where there's a nice limit, and we need a systematic way to classify Markov chains, basically just to avoid the two problematic cases that I showed you before. So they could show up in a more complicated way, but I'm just trying to eliminate these two problematic behaviors. Okay, and that's state classification. So I'm gonna introduce some definitions, and these definitions are actually pretty simple if you work through some examples, and that's what we're going to be doing. So first we say that state k is accessible from state j, which we write as j with an arrow going to k, if it is possible to reach state k starting from state j. You could take more than one time step to reach state k, that's fine. Okay, so what that means formally is that the probability of an n step transition is positive for some n, okay? And we also define pjk of zero to be the probability of going from a state j to state k in exactly zero time steps, which seems silly because what that means is you're always going to stay on yourself. So this is only one when j equals k. And what that means is by default, we have j accessible from j, which we kind of need later on. So in this example, I'm gonna draw a three state Markov chain. I don't need to draw the values, okay? Because the values don't matter. I just need to see what's possible, not what is the exact value of probability. So I'm not writing the values when I do this classification. Okay, so I just need to know that these values are positive. And so which states are accessible from each other? So first of all, uh, let's start on state one. And I can see one can go to one, two can go to two, and three can go to three. And these are actually by default. So even though I have uh, these self loops here, I didn't even need to look at the self loops to figure this out because by default, we always say a state is accessible from itself. Okay, now one can also go to two, two can go back to one, three can go to two, three can go to one, that's two time steps now, but uh, we can see that it's not possible to reach three from one or two, so I'm not gonna write those down. Okay, let's build on that idea. So states J and K communicate, which we write as J with a double-sided arrow to K, if we have J to K and K to J. 
So since J goes to J by default, we also have J communicating with J by default. And so intuitively, J communicating with K means that it is possible to go back and forth between uh, J and K, even if it takes many steps, right? So it doesn't mean that you'll always do this, but it's possible to do it. And so a communicating class is a subset of the states. So it's a subset. So C is a subset of one through K, such that all the states in the class C communicate with each other. So it's possible to go back and forth between all the states in the class. So if J is in C, then K is in C only if and only if J and K communicate. And a finite state Markov chain can always be broken up or partitioned into disjoint communicating classes, okay? So this is a really important step that we take in our classification. So here's an example. I'm gonna draw six states, and I'm gonna draw some arcs. Okay, and we're gonna classify these into communicating classes, okay? So what are the communicating classes? I can see I have C1, which is one, two, and three, because those can all talk to each other, but then they can't go any further, okay? Then I just have four on its own, Okay, and then I have five and six uh, together, okay? So those are kind of the states that can go back and forth with each other, and then any other transitions are sort of, um, uh, you know, I can't really take them back. So if I jump from four to three, I can't come back to four, and so then four and three don't communicate, and then they're not part of the same communicating class. And here, it just so happened that, you know, in order to squeeze things into the slide, it looks like everything was kind of nicely grouped together in these uh, left to right groups. But I could have had an example where, say, one and six were in a communicating class. It doesn't have to be in ascending order like I had here. Okay, so we'll say that a Markov chain is irreducible if it only has one communicating class, okay? So there's just one class, everything talks to everything else. So here's an example. So I have four states, right? And I'm gonna draw some arcs and I wanna figure out what are the communicating classes. So as before, I have C1, which is one and two, okay? So we're just seeing that one and two talk to each other, but not three and two. Three is on its own and then four is on its own. Okay, so I have three classes, and so it's not going to be irreducible because there are three classes, not one. I could draw a different Markov chain. Okay, so here's a different Markov chain, which has uh, one, two, three, four again. I'm gonna draw a different set of arcs now just to get a different uh, behavior. So here I've drawn more arcs. Okay, and here I can see that the communicating classes um, it's just really going to be one class, okay? So let's see. So I have C1, one can talk to two, can talk to three, can go back to two and three, can go back to four, three, two, one. So everything can reach everything else. So I just put everything into the same class. Okay, so one, two, three, four, and this is irreducible. Okay, let's introduce a new concept. So we'll say that the communicating class C is transient if there are states, okay, J is in the class, K is outside the class, such that J can talk, is access, or K is accessible from J, but J is not accessible from K. Okay, so the intuition here is that there is a path to leave the class from which there is no return, okay? That's what this means. So it's possible to get outside of a communicating class and not come back, okay? It doesn't mean that you wander around and then with some probability you come back. So once you leave by this particular path, there's no way back. That means you're transient. If a class is not transient, that means it's recurrent, okay? So we call it recurrent. And these words are chosen because if you're a transient class, eventually you'll leak all of your probability out and you will not happen again. And if you're recurrent, if you're in that class, things just keep happening there over and over, so they keep recurring. And so at least one communicating class in a chain will always be recurrent. Okay, here we see that class two is transient because the state three can leak out. 
class three is recurrent because it can't, and class one is recurrent because it can't. And in the second chain, class one is recurrent because it's the only class, and there has to be a recurrent class. Okay, so let's look at another example here. So I'm drawing a different chain with five states, and I'm going to group things into communicating classes. So I'm gonna have one, and then I'm gonna have two and three, and I'm going to have four and five. So those are my three communicating classes. Okay, C1 and C3 are recurrent, and C2 here is transient, okay, because it can leak probability over to um, C1. So the period of a state J is the greatest common divisor, the GCD, of the lengths of all the cycles from J back to itself, okay? So all states in a communicating class have the same period, okay? So they, if one of them has a given period, they all have the same period. And we say a state is aperiodic if the period is one, and if there are no cycles from a state back to itself. So let's say it just sends all of its probability away, we're still going to set its period to one by default, okay? The shortcut here in evaluating these um, uh, periods is that if there's a cycle from a state to itself, so a cycle of length one, the class itself will be aperiodic, so the whole class will have period one. And a Markov chain is called aperiodic if every state in the Markov chain has period one. Okay, or they're aperiodic. So in this example, let's look at the periods. So I see that one here has period one, and two has a loop of length two, three has a length of length two, four has a self loop of one, and because five is in the same communicating class, I know it has the same period as four, so I also say that it's one. Okay, so now we're gonna wrap up with a long example. So I'm gonna draw 10 states now, and we're gonna work through all of these concepts that we saw um, for this particular chain, for which I haven't drawn any arc values, just the arcs where the transition probabilities are positive. Okay, so first we're gonna work out what the communicating classes are. So the states in C1 are gonna be these ones. So one, two, and three. Then I'm gonna have four by itself. I'm gonna have uh, five and six, and finally seven, eight, and nine. And hopefully you can already kind of see why that's true based on where they kind of stay together and leak out probability. Okay, what are the cycle lengths? Well, if I look at class one, there's a cycle of length three, and that's it. There's no cycle for state four. There's a cycle of length one, a cycle of length two for state five. Um, there's a cycle of length three, and so on. Here I have a cycle of length two and of length four and of length six and so on. So I have lots of different cycle lengths. So then the period here, the GCD of this first three will be three because it has no cycles will be one. GCD of one, two, three is one. And GCD of two, four, six, and so on is going to be two. Okay, so those are the periods. And then we'll just say which classes are transient or recurrent. Well, class one, we can see that it doesn't leak out any probability, so it's recurrent. Okay, so it keeps its probability if it has it. Uh, class two does leak out probability, it's transient. Class three leaks out probability, so it's transient. And class four doesn't, so it's recurrent. Okay, so that's how we classify a Markov chain. And we'll see why we wanted to do this in the next video.